Hi everyone, and welcome to our channel. In this episode, we're going to take a look at one of the icons, Create Texture Area, that we find on our Modeling tab. It's located on the top row, right-hand side. It's only available in Aspire because you'll actually be creating components. Once you click on the icon, you'll see a new window that opens up and it shows you the options you have. You can take a component, this is now just for components only, and you can move them in the X direction a certain amount, the Y direction a certain amount. You can also offset the second row by a certain amount, both in the X and the Y. You can also rotate them, and we'll get to that at the end. So, here's a real-world example. I got a commission to create a 3D model, and within that 3D model was this small design. I'll call it Fish Scales. And I thought, well, there's a couple different ways that this could be approached. So let's take a look at them. My first approach was to simply draw a vector, an oval vector, the size that I thought would be appropriate. From that vector of an oval, I created a flat plate. Well, it's not a flat plate. I chose the profile of a dome, but I limited the height of it, simply because I prefer to have my flat domes have a slightly rounded edge to them. I think it looks a little bit more natural. And of course, I set it to merge. There's that small little indent that you can see on each of the scales. It's a simple little oval, a negative shape, and it's set to add, so it actually indents that little scale. At this point, I would just simply make a model of the visual 3D components. I then want to fade the component down because I know it's going to get tucked under the previous one on top. I can then use the mirror tool to create new components to the left or the right. And I'm thinking this is pretty easy. And I make a copy of that original component, mirror it to the right. And you can see it's sort of getting offset a little bit. And I also start to realize I'm going to have to do this similarly with row after row after row. And I thought to myself, there must be an easier way. So let's delete these. That was option number one. And I'm sure I could have worked it out, but it seemed a lot of work for a little bit of a space. Ah, the array copy tool. Will that do it? I know that I can select my component choosing the array copy tool I can say how many rows I want in the X and how many I want in the Y I know that I could either use the gap or the offset between each of the components and I would see how it looks I did not offset the X or the Y yet But it wasn't quite right, so I needed to delete that and start over again with my single component and trying to guess what the correct number is for the offset. So it's getting better, but now I need to offset that second and fourth row. So of course, I have to delete what I've created and try it again. And I'm starting to get a little frustrated because it's a guessing game. We're getting closer. And you can see the number of components that have been created. So I'm simply going to group them together so I can have one unit to work with. 
Now I want to resize them down. The end result is that when you resize this type of a component, it also changes the dimension of each of the scales. Well, that's not exactly what I wanted. So let's try our third example, the Create Texture Area. I don't use this tool often enough, and that's why it was my last choice. I had forgotten about it, actually. So we have to offset both in the X and the Y. And we can hit Apply. The nice thing about this tool is that if we're not happy with the end results, we can simply input new numbers and hit Apply again. We don't have to delete the existing component that was created. So it's a lot more visual and user-friendly than the copy array or the mirroring tool. And you could play with the numbers until you get the end result that you like. One of the benefits with this approach is that if you wanted to resize your textured area, the size of the scales does not change. The size of the total component does, but you'll notice that the scales stay the same size. That's a real plus. can always go back and change them if you'd like. If you want to change the shape and size of the scale, if you click on the edit option after you've created your component, your first component in the bottom left hand corner of your workspace will be the scale that can be adjusted. And consequently, all the other scales will be changed as well. No matter where you have your original component, the first one at the bottom left will be the one to be altered. And it's nice that I don't have to go back in and recreate anything. I can work with an existing pattern right from the software. I have some other vectors created, I, so I select that outline and select the component I've just created, and I'm going to keep everything inside. Of course, a warning message will show up saying it needs to be baked, which is fine, and there's that end result of that little pattern. I created the two little swirls, just as a model height, changed them, changed the level to merge, and that's the beginning of the design for this 3D model. Using the texture area tool made it a lot easier than the other two options. But let me show you a few of the other things that can and can't be done with this option. I'm going to create that shape again, just a flat disk. And if I have it and create the textured area, as we've done before, I'm going to select just random numbers. So we have this. We know how to do this already. What if we wanted to rotate our component? We select the Edit option. You can see the first component in the bottom left is highlighted but we can't rotate it. We can adjust it in the X and the Y, but we cannot rotate it. So let's delete that whole pattern, go back to our original component and rotate it. Then with that selected, use the Create Texture Area tool again. Again, just some random numbers to show the example. hit apply. Well that's not what I expected. 
I thought since I had rotated the component, it would have rotated the end result, but it didn't. Let's try this one more time. If I take my vector and rotate that, and then create a new component, selecting that new rotated component and now using the Create Texture Area, the end result will be that the new component is rotated. So it really comes down to how you draw your vectors and create your shape originally. You can adjust again the X or the Y dimension of that new pattern, as well as the spacing. You can rotate the entire component but not the individual components themselves. So the answer to solve the problem of the rotation is that you have to bake the component. I've created that component again in a vertical sense, and if I rotate it and now bake it, this is where the bake becomes important. It applies the properties, not only in the X and the Y and the Z, but also its location in the rotation sense. Now, this is the end result I was looking for. Baking process becomes the important step in this whole thing. Let's look at the last little bit of options within the Create Texture Area tool. It's called a reflection, and it's at the very bottom of your window. You can see there are four little squares. In reality, what happens is the software will take your component and make four separate components in the bottom left-hand corner. And that's what these little squares represent. You can see this is the first component, and you can rotate it or mirror it, and it'll be reflected upon the first bottom left-hand corner component, because that's the small square that I chose. And you can flip them or rotate them 90 degrees. If I choose the bottom right hand one, you can see that how the, your second component in the first row was changed. So if you look at the pattern and only look at the first four, the first two on the left hand side of the first row and the first two of the second row on the left hand side, that's what these little squares represent. And you could get really creative with a lot of different aspects of rotation and reflection. You can also separate them, shift them over. But if you use the option to shift over the row in the X direction, your first component is still going to be the original one on the second row. Not the new one that's starting to appear, but it will be this one in the second row that is the operative one. I think there could be many, many options to use this. Within the software itself, on the clip art tab within the clip art folder 
there is a special subfolder for just the textured area tiles. Pre-designed to be easily used and manipulated. Or you can use any 3D component, clip art, or STL file that you may find somewhere else. That opens a whole new door for designing backgrounds and textures. So if you're wondering what the original design of my 3D model was meant to look like, here's a picture. And here's the end result that I've created within Aspire. You can see how small and insignificant that area of the scales is compared to the rest of the design. But it's important to know how to make them. And the bottom line is, how can I make them efficiently and quick? I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on a little tiny area unless it's absolutely necessary. So in this case, the textured area tool wound up being the best choice. I hope you learned a little bit about this seldom used tool, at least for me, and it may open up new ideas for you to create interesting textures. I'd love to see what you come up with. You may want to paste them on your social media or on the Vectric forum, just to let everybody else know of what you're able to do with this tool. If you'd like to learn more about the software, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the bell to be reminded of our new videos. And of course, as always, if you need help, send me an email, mm.mazolic.com. I'll be glad to help. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Enjoy.